tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Taking a quick break here to show some love to a sponsor that's shown so much to us, BetterHelp Online Therapy. I've got a scenario for you. How well would you take care of your car if you had to keep the same one your entire life? You'd probably keep it in pristine condition, right? That's how our brains work, so why don't we treat them that way? I admit that in my younger years, checking in on my mental health wasn't something I thought about much, if at all, really. You know, folks, how we care for our minds affects how we experience life, so it's important to invest time and care into keeping them healthy. There are plenty of ways to support a healthy brain, like learning a new language or taking power naps. There's also BetterHelp Online Therapy. BetterHelp is online therapy that'll help you deal with life's difficulties quickly, conveniently, and inexpensively. It's helped me through countless situations. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with a therapist who specializes in your unique difficulties, whether it be grief, stress, anxiety, fear, depression, etc. You can text anytime and schedule calls or Zoom meetings weekly. With BetterHelp, help is never more than a text away. It's professional counseling in your pocket. Horror Hill podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash horror hill. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror hill. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 19 of Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and tonight we're going to Bethel, New York in the year, you guessed it, 2069. The future, a period of the unknown where anything is possible. Take a peek into one horrific mind as it describes how wonderful everything is, until it isn't. This age-old concept is becoming more and more popular, isn't it? Humanity and technology got so focused on what they could do, they didn't stop to consider if they should. You're listening to the Standard Edition of this program, 
If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all of our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, from Horror Hill newcomer Chris Kester, I give you 2069. The final notes of the national anthem rang out through the venue. The location was Bethel, New York. The year was 2069. The centennial celebration had been in the works for years now, and each day had gone out of its way to top the last. I just could not get over the fact that Jimi Hendrix was standing on stage a matter of feet away from myself in the flesh. It was so surreal to be living in a time when this was possible. Jimmy was moving on to Purple Haze as I sat back in the grass to marvel at what a fantastic prospect it was that all of this had finally come to fruition. You see, the clones have been around for quite some time now. They do not live amongst us. Of course, at least we are made to believe that they don't. From what I read about the intense training the clones must go through to accomplish the tasks that the people they are cloned from were once able to, it seems unlikely to me personally. Plenty of conspiracy theorists will tell anyone who will listen about how anyone who dares to question authority is quickly collected and replaced. The world keeps on moving as if nothing happened. To think I have just witnessed Credence Clearwater Revival, Janis Joplin, Joe Cocker, and the Grateful Dead, among other legends, perform live all these years after their passing. It's just beyond me to be able to wrap my mind around the magnitude of what's unfolding. Woodstock is remembered as the most incredible music festival of all time, although plenty can be mentioned in conversation. The attempts to hold new Woodstock festivals with new bands and artists never went over well. It was the essence of the original that they were always after, but that wouldn't happen without the people who made it the most remarkable event of the 20th century. Dolly the Sheep in 1996 may have been the first public announcement of successful cloning, but the general public had always been quite ignorant of the true extent that cloning had reached. Looking back, it's a bit strange that many people of that time wouldn't be aware that the ability to clone humans was out there during such a period. Still, the truth is that scientists had been collecting the DNA of the powerful and talented for the time that they were able to clone for long before then. In the early 2000s, it was already possible for the rich to have their beloved pets cloned in the case of their untimely death, or whatever the reason. This, of course, is how I can enjoy this once-in-a-lifetime experience that's before me right now. It's also why sports fans can finally see who the better boxer is, the best home run hitter, or if Jordan was truly the greatest one-on-one player of all time. Certain Christians hold out hope that one day the true Shroud of Turin will be unveiled so that they can worship at the feet of the clone of their true savior. There is another group of Christians, of course, who see this as heresy and are entirely against clones in general, but especially one of their Lord, which they believe would surely bring about the apocalypse through the second coming and all that. Jimmy had made his way through a song that was originally improvised for Woodstock in 69, but of course was now just a recreation. The next was the last song of the night and one of my favorites from the legendary performer, Hey Joe, a song about infidelity, passion, and a perfect way to end a night that none of us in the audience would ever forget. 
As he finished his final song to the sound of thunderous applause, Jimmy grabbed the microphone and began to look a bit out of character from how he had for the entirety of the performance. He said, Thank you all, but there's something that you need to know. There's something that they're not tell- Jimmy was cut off, and a misty look entered his eye as he began to stare off into space. A man in a black suit came out from behind the stage and grabbed Jimmy by the shoulders while reaching his head forward to the microphone. He said, Thank you all for joining us for the Woodstock Centennial Celebration. We would like to wish everyone a safe trip home, and please be courteous to event staff and pick up after yourselves on the way out. The man led a still dazed-looking Jimi Hendrix off the stage and back to the area from which he came. Man, they must have given that clone a little bit of the actual Jimi Hendrix experience, if you know what I mean, bro, my friend Nathan said before sipping the last of his overpriced beer. He looked like he was frying his balls off at the end there. I rubbed the back of my head and considered this, as I had also been taken aback by this last portion. I don't know, man, I said. That's not really what that looked like to me, and it sounded like he was trying to say something before he started to daze off. He looked pretty disturbed and worried before just kind of zoning out like something had stopped him from finishing his sentence. Not the feel-good ending I was hoping for. Well, life isn't always just a bunch of roses and flower power, man. Deal with it. I will head back to my place and start a movie marathon. Are you down to join? Nathan asked. Nah, I think I'm going to pass, but thanks for the invite, I replied. It's been a long few days, and I think I'm ready to crash at home and sleep it all off. Suit yourself. See you later, Joachim. Don't let the market crash and get to you. Enjoy your time off, man. You've earned it. Nathan relayed this message and then reached in to shake my hand and turned it into a one-arm hug. Yeah, I'll do that. I assume that doesn't affect your clientele much, does it? I asked. Nathan let out a laugh and answered, Nah, man, people have got to have their edibles and coffee no matter what. We chuckled a bit at this and patted each other on the back before heading our separate ways. I had made my way up in the wide world of stocks, and Nathan had taken a more unconventional route by opening a cannabis coffee shop, which turned into the biggest chain of them in the New York area. It's hard to believe that there was a time when marijuana was illegal and alcohol was legal. Surely it was for political reasons and not logical ones. The only deaths caused by marijuana back then must have been due to its legality forcing criminals into the picture. How could something that causes no deaths per year be held in worse esteem than something that causes so many? I headed towards my exit, which was on the other side of the venue from Nathan's. Something caught my eye as I made it to the edge of the stage, and I felt an immediate sinking feeling in my stomach. It was Jimmy, with a group of men in black suits surrounding him. He was fighting and struggling against them, trying to free himself and head back toward the stage. I couldn't believe my eyes. I tapped the side of my glasses and zoomed in to ensure what I saw. The men restrained Jimmy and shoved a hypodermic needle into the side of his neck. He became instantly unresponsive and they formed a wall blocking the view. They took him off into a limo that pulled up with more men in black, and it seemed that most people had been too busy making their way to the exit to pay any attention. What in the world was going on here? I felt like I was losing my mind. I returned to my vehicle and set my path for it to take me home on the large touchscreen display in the center. The car backed out of the spot I was in and began to take me in the direction I had set. The face scanning technology read my face through the steering wheel camera, which was mostly useless in emergencies, and suggested a playlist for what it considered to be my current mood. I agreed, as it was usually spot on, and drifted deeper into thought. I knew that there was something off about how those men came and got Jimmy off the stage at the show's end. Seeing what I saw on the way out proved that to me beyond a shadow of a doubt. I felt the need to find out more and try to get to the bottom of what was happening, but there was surveillance everywhere you could go. 
I formed an idea of how I might be able to get away from it without drawing too much attention and used my voice control to reroute my vehicle's destination. Take me to the library? The car responded in the affirmative and I was on my way to the closest haven of education. There had always been chatter about how inhumane cloning was and that the process behind using clones for our entertainment had a dark side to it that none of us were permitted to see. It's just so hard to read into things like that because the only things we see are the ones they want us to see. They do their best to ensure that we're all drinking the Kool-Aid and accepting whatever lies they tell us along the way. The country still maintains the guise of freedom, so there are ways around it if you try hard enough. As I pulled up into the library, I had a nagging dread. Did I want to get myself into this mess? Where would I end up if this didn't go well and the government found out that I was snooping into their classified business? However, my sense of duty was greater than my sense of fear, and I dragged myself out of the vehicle and made my way into the building. I let the lady behind the desk scan my library ID, which was kept inside the chip in my right palm where all our information was. Driver's licenses, credit cards, debit cards, all those rewards programs for the different stores you go to. It was all contained within this little chip that they put in either your right hand or your forehead, whichever you prefer. I let her know I was hoping to use a computer for a project. She scanned me in and handed me a tactile keyboard with a mouse pad and mouse attached to the side. The mouse held to the pad was some magnetic type of force that I never fully understood. The whole setup was very light and easy to carry. She pointed me in the direction of my pod and told me I was in number 7. I stepped over to my pod and scanned my right hand to gain access. As I did, the hatch lifted and revealed the large padded chair that sat in the middle of the full screen sphere that was beginning its logon process and welcoming me by name. I slid into the chair and hit the button on the side of the armrest to close the hatch. First, I was going to create some diversions that would hopefully aid in my plan to throw off anyone who might snoop through my flagged search terms. I typed, how to outline a research paper, and clicked through a few results. I found an outline that appeared to be useful and dragged the window around to the back of the kiosk's sphere-shaped screen behind my chair as I would not need it. Next was the search, Understanding the Mind of a Conspiracy Theorist. I dragged this one down below my feet and moved on to the next window. Next, it was time to input some pointed questions about the cloning programs. I typed out a few searches such as, where does the cloning program take place in the US, and are the clones mistreated in the US? Both searches yielded plenty of results which would be helpful and most likely land me on a watch list all at the same time. I opened a document to start a rough draft of the supposed paper just to go the extra mile and have an alibi. I used the joystick on the chair's left arm to turn back toward the outline I had placed there earlier, read over it a bit to get a rough idea, and then turned back to type up a passable amount in my draft. My point in coming to the library was to make it much more believable in case anybody decided to look into what I was doing. It would be well worth it, because I was treading on territory that the government did not take lightly. The first search led me to realize that each state has a cloning program, and that the one for New York was held in a rural area of Ithaca called Newfield. The second search led me to more conspiracy-type sites. I read about how they had reason to believe that every state had mass graveyards for all of the clones that did not adhere to the plan they had for them, or were unable to live up to the incredibly high standards that were set for them. They spoke of the inhumane living conditions they were made to suffer through, and even spun off the rails a bit, rambling on about how there was an entire clone army ready for when the government would impose martial law and enslave the whole of humanity. That level of cooperation between all the world's governments seemed a bit far-fetched to me, but I guess it is crazy times that we live in, and anything is possible. I considered all this information carefully and thought about my next move. 
I right-clicked and selected the Exit All Windows option before signing out of my profile and opening the hatch to the computer kiosk. I indicated on the outside of the sphere that I was done using the computer and scanned my hand to ensure I was logged out completely. After this, I returned to the librarian. I handed her my keyboard and mouse before thanking her and making my way to the exit. I still had some time to burn on my vacation, and this was just too interesting to pass up. I weighed my options and considered all of the things that I had studied. There was no avoiding it. I would have to see what Ithaca was like at this time of year. It was about two and a half hours away by car, but it would be significantly less than that in an air taxi. The drone-like vehicles were much faster than traveling by street, and luckily you could call them out no matter where you were, so I decided to leave my car at the library and call one out to take me from there. I called one up and let them know that I would need a ride to the Robert H. Treman State Park, which was just 10 minutes down the road from the cloning facility. This would be an interesting way to spend my vacation, but I had to keep my self-interest in mind. If, at any time, I felt that I was jeopardizing myself, I would leave in a hurry. The air taxi arrived and I entered the back seat. This model was like a huge drone large enough to fit five people, three in the back seat and two up front. Other models were much faster and used newer technology, but this one would do just fine for my short trip. I scanned my right hand for the driver for identification and payment. I told him I was just heading to the state park for a hike. Luckily, due to my informal festival attire, it was believable enough. Once the payment was authorized and he had my information all set up, we were good to go, and he took off from the library parking lot en route to the state park next to my true destination. I wasn't even sure what my initial plan was heading towards the cloning facility. It had all kind of been on a whim in the first place. I thought I could do some research in the area and maybe even sneak a peek if I was lucky enough. I pulled out my phone, which was also my laptop and tablet, and could fold into different shapes for different uses. I thought I would look at what there was to do in the area in case this whole spying on a highly protected government facility thing didn't work out. I was very happy to see that there was a facility tour available to those interested. I considered letting the driver know to bring me straight there, but I thought it might be worth it to go for a little hike and ease my mind. This was a lot to take in, after all. I folded my phone into its slimmest form factor and shoved it back into my pocket. Once we arrived, I thanked the driver and made sure to tip him well for his troubles. I got out and took a look at the beauty that surrounded me. This park was known for its beautiful waterfalls. I had been there a few times as a kid during the summer, but it had been a long time since I could take it all in. I tapped the side of my glasses three times, bringing up my favorite relaxing playlist. This would be a nice way to take my mind off the insanity that was being presented, if only for a moment. I took the stone pathway that ran alongside the water, carved into the side of the cliffs. It was so relaxing that I could almost take my mind completely off the terror being caused and what I might be getting myself into by trying to get to the bottom of it. I followed the trail past many happy campers, waving as I passed by and enjoying the scenery and a little bit of light exercise. I made my way to a place that was the main hub in the park, a breathtaking waterfall that was called Lucifer Falls a favorite of the locals and a spot where you could almost always find plenty of campers swimming and relaxing. I would not be doing any swimming today myself, though, so I followed the carving trail alongside the water and up the side of the cliff. I made my way towards the top of the falls, gazing upon the rest of the park from the high ground on which I stood. It was truly amazing. And I knew then it was the right decision to have made the stop here at the park before taking on the daunting task that lied ahead. After taking my time to take in the scenery for a moment, I returned, feeling ready to follow through with the effort that had brought me this far. There was still time to make it to the last tour of the day, and I had plenty of research to do after that appointment was made as I turned to head toward the stone path, though I saw something that I found to be strange. 
A slight deviation to the trail led to a large metal door built into the cliff. It was left open, though I could tell it was usually a highly secured area. It seemed a bit too secure for just a state park area. It felt out of place. Something else drew me closer, and my blood ran cold as it did. There were bloodstains on the door. The stains were fresh, heavy, and towards the bottom of the door, with a trail of blood leading inside. My thoughts began to race. There were signs up around the door that made it clear there was no entry for the general public, but I could cite the fresh blood as my concern if I was confronted about it. I know I had to worry about self-preservation, but someone was in trouble. There was no other choice to make. I started to head for the door and did not look back. I kept as quiet as possible as I made my way into the hallway. I stayed close to the wall and shimmied alongside it before peeking around the corner to ensure the coast was clear. There was a wide open room with many doors along the side that appeared almost prison-like in structure. Some men in white coats were heading my way. I began to panic internally. I spotted a door close to the hall and dashed over, praying that it was not locked. The door pushed right open, and I made it inside before the men were close enough to suspect a thing. I was now sitting with my back to the door in a dark corridor with faint flickering lights. There was a window on the door, which did not do much to aid my level of anxiety as the two men grew closer. My glasses detected the darkness and entered their night vision mode automatically. Much like in a parking garage, a set of stairs was close by. They were only leading down as we were at the top of whatever facility this was that I had stumbled upon. The men were drawing near. I made sure to hush my breathing and began to listen in, hoping to hear anything of use. Where we were, what was going on, what had happened with the bloodstained door, anything that could help shed some light on my current situation. Johnson has become increasingly careless. I am dumbfounded that he would just leave the door wide open like that. I could hear one voice saying. The other man replied as they made their way toward the hall I had just left. Could you imagine if a camper wandered in on all this? We're going to have to terminate him without a doubt. We can't risk losing our funding. That would be catastrophic. The first man spoke again as they drew uncomfortably close. I cringed and hoped that they did not decide to make a quick detour in my direction for any reason. Yes, it surely would have. Not nearly as bad as if that clone had gotten loose and started running its mouth to the campers, though. Johnson at least did well to capture the clone and eliminate the threat. It's a shame that it'll be the end of his time here, but it's a much better end than he would have met if he hadn't dealt with the problem. I couldn't believe my ears. Were these people saying that they just murdered a clone? Beyond that... Are they implying that they would have murdered this scientist, or whatever he is, if he didn't murder the clone in time? This is grim. I had stumbled upon something that was much more sinister than what I could have possibly imagined. I think the Bible says, knock, and the door will be opened unto you. Right now, I wish that I had not knocked on this freaking door. The two were passing by right behind me and heading towards the trail of blood in the hallway that I had entered through. I tapped both sides of my glasses to initiate the recording function. This would upload to my cloud so I could have some type of documentation of what was going on here. If the worst were to happen, then my loved ones would be able to have some kind of explanation. I moved to the stairs and began to make my way down carefully. My dread was reaching a fever pitch, and I had no idea how I was going to make it out of this situation in one piece. As I reached the next floor down, the lighting became clearer. There was a door on this floor as well. I snuck up to the door's window to see what the floor contained. There were entirely too many bodies moving around on this floor. I would have to try my luck on a lower one. 
I couldn't make out much through the window other than more men in white coats and some more imposing men holding guns and dressed in what looked like riot gear. I tried to keep my cool and continued back to the stairs in a hunched over position, making sure to avoid being seen through the window. I went down the next flight of stairs and nearly jumped out of my skin as I heard the door above come open, followed by the sound of footsteps. There was a small broom closet on this floor, and I moved quickly, found my way into it, and closed it behind me in one smooth motion. Did you hear about Johnson? came a voice from the floor above. Yeah, rough deal. Those damn clones can be a pain to work with. That one he had been training seemed to be docile enough, but you never know when they'll get a wild hair up their butt and make a run for it. The man sighed and continued. What can you do, though? At least he'll make it out of here with his life. It would have been a shame to see him end up on the bottom floor with all the other failed experiments. Can't believe how many they have to go through just to get one that can carry out their duties. The other voice returned. Yeah, we shouldn't be talking about it right now, though. The higher-ups are pissed, and we don't want the wrong person to walk in on us spreading the word. From what I hear, Johnson could still end up down there, depending on the way things go. On the poor guy's birthday to top it all off. What a tough break. I'll see you tomorrow, man. I'm pulling a double today. Jeez, better grab some coffee in the break room. You don't want to fall asleep on the job. Plenty of strange crap going on around here lately. Just keep your head on a swivel. He laughed a bit as if to lighten the mood on what seemed like a serious statement. Catch you later. Heavy steps came down the stairs beside me, which likely belonged to the guard who was sticking around. I also heard some footsteps ascending to the top floor as the other one made his way to the exit. The bottom floor was the place that I had to see. Video evidence of something like that could make this entire trip worth the trouble. However, I'd have to be careful to keep it encrypted and be very selective of how I used it moving forward. I heard both doors close and gave the men a moment to continue on their paths before sneaking out and making my descent down the stairs. I quickly rounded the stairs for the third floor, as I could gather that this was where the man had gone for the break room. The next floor is where the stairs bottomed out, and I began worrying about what I would witness. I lifted my head when I drew nearer to the window and saw a long hallway. I didn't come this far to just turn back now. I took a deep breath and pushed open the door, moving quickly down the hallway. At the end of the hallway, there was a secure door. The handle had a touch screen that asked you to scan your ID or enter your username. I knew this could be a mistake if I set off some kind of alarm, but I had a sense of purpose at that point that I would not push aside. I keyed in the last name, Johnson, and waited to see the reaction. It greeted me by saying, Welcome, Johnson. Please enter your PIN. This one would be a complete shot in the dark. I became enveloped in a cold sweat and thought back on all I had heard since entering this facility. What could this man have used as a pin? It could be literally anything. An anniversary, a day that someone passed away, a year of graduation, a birthday… Wait a second. Today? Today was his birthday. Jesus Christ, let it be his friggin' birthday. If not, this would be the last thing I ever typed. I went to the number pad and typed the numbers in. 0818. The handle clicked open and a green light appeared around the edge of the screen. I turned the handle and pushed the door open. The stench was something I would not wish for anyone to experience in their lifetime the pure rot of decay. I pushed through the smell and found my way to an incredible yet entirely horrifying sight. The bodies were segregated into groups, stacked on detachable shelves that a forklift could move to another destination. I took a closer look and realized that each group contained stacks of bodies of the same clone. 
This must be where the ones go that don't adhere to the training protocols or are unable to excel in the needed manner. My stomach was wretched, but I continued down the path for a bit just to ensure everything was well documented. I saw the ovens where they must eventually cremate the bodies. I even saw the tables where they did the autopsies and sick experiments, surrounded by all sorts of medical tools and plastic lining. None of this struck me quite as much as when I walked by one certain group of bodies that were in one of the giant cubbies. It was a pile of naked, dead clones of Jimi Hendrix, all in a neat stack, just waiting for their turn in the crematorium. That clone was trying to make the atrocities in this place known, but those men in black suits stopped him. He was trying to warn the people at the concert. I got the message, though, and now that I had this evidence, his cries for help will not have been in vain. I turned and headed back for the exit. I made it back up the stairs carefully with no problem. After making sure that nobody was coming to the top floor, I bolted out and back down the first hallway I had seen in this facility. The blood was now conspicuously absent from the ground, and the door had been shut tight. I made it out of the door with no problem and was back atop the beautiful Lucifer Falls. I was going to find a nearby hotel room or maybe even a cabin in the park. I needed some rest. After all, I had a cloning facility tour to make tomorrow. This should be interesting. The men in black were surrounding my cabin. A scientist was with them and readying a needle that he likely planned to plunge into my neck. They shouted out a warning. We have you surrounded, Mr. Fredrickson. If you come out with your hands up, we can make this as painless as possible. Shit. This was impossible. How had they found out that I was in their facility? There must have been cameras. Of course there were cameras. What was I thinking? I don't know why I decided to stay in the same place where I had just seen all those atrocities. The clones' bodies were stacked in neatly organized boxes, just waiting to be incinerated for not adhering to their wishes. This was not good. I had to think of a way out of here. I didn't know who I thought I was kidding. There was no way out of there. This will be my end. I tapped both sides of my glasses to start recording a message for my family. Mom, Dad, I love you, and this may be the last thing I ever get to tell you. Check my drive. There's a video that I recorded last night. You must get to it quickly before they take my phone and erase all the data. I sent the message and marked it highly important in hopes that they would be able to do as I said in time, though in my heart I found it highly unlikely. Joachim Fredrickson, you have ignored our request to exit the cabin peacefully. Therefore, we will remove you by force. The voice came from the cabin door, and I began to call out for them to wait. I'll come peacefully, please, I'm on my way. I was cut off by the sound of crashing glass from the window directly beside my bed. Flaming bottles flew in through the newly open window, and flames began to spread across the room. I thrashed about in the bed, and suddenly, I awoke, still thrashing and in a cold sweat. It was so hot, I was burning and there was nowhere for me to go. The warm sunlight was shining through the unbroken window directly onto my body. I was starting to lose it, but how could I not be after seeing what I saw just last night? I wasn't even sure what I was going to do with the evidence that I had collected. I knew one thing for sure, though. While I was over here, I had to get a load of this so-called tour of the cloning facility. There was no way they would show the public anything like what I had just witnessed. I was interested to see what it was that they presented to the public, though, and the next tour started in about an hour. Plenty of time to go catch a bite to eat before heading over. I was starving. 
I made the hike to the front of the park and asked the rangers up front where the nearest terminal was. They let me know it was just a stone's throw up the road and that I could take that into town if that was where I was headed. I told them that it was and thanked them for their help. As I arrived, I couldn't help but think of how nice it would be once they had these terminals set up for long distance travel. Now they were only to make your way around a certain city or town. Everybody knew that it wouldn't be long before we could take one from New York to Los Angeles, but for now they were still useful for what they were. The station consisted of a pod that was about nine feet tall with a six foot diameter and a large tube with tracks that the pods shot across at incredible speeds. I scanned my right hand at the payment screen and the terminal accepted my payment and information. The clear door to the pod opened and revealed a large cushioned chair with a harness to strap yourself into. I tapped on the touchscreen to input my destination and the hatch door closed. A voice came over the speaker and thanked me for choosing to ride the pod. It ran through the safety procedures that I would need to follow in case of an emergency, and then I was on my way. It was a scenic little ride, with my favorite landmark being the Newfield Covered Bridge. Directly by this was where the pod came to a stop and opened my hatch door to let me out. The trip was a very short one, but I didn't see the point in walking down the side of a busy roadway. There was a diner next to the pod stop, right on the way to the cloning facility tour. My stomach growled at the thought of a nice hot meal, and I followed its lead before realizing what my feet were doing. The diner was a quaint little place, the kind you could hardly tell wasn't just a house from the outside. I walked in and took a seat at a table. A man who looked like he might own the place came up to me quickly and asked what they could get ready for me. Most big chain restaurants have been completely automated for quite some time now. It was refreshing to have a real human interaction while grabbing some grub. I told him that I would take some pancakes as high as he could stack them and a cup of black coffee with the promise of more when I finished that one. He chuckled and assured me that it would be out shortly before heading back to make the food himself, or at least aid those doing it. In just a moment, he returned with a full steaming coffee cup and an ornate carafe with plenty more for when I finished that one. After making sure there was nothing else, he returned to the kitchen. I thought about the whole situation and just drifted off in thought for a bit as I waited. I began to question everything I had ever known about the clones. One year, a dream boxing matchup was held in Madison Square Garden. I was lucky enough to go on the company's dime with a few colleagues. The matchup was between Muhammad Ali and Mike Tyson. Ali came out on top and won by points after a long battle, but Tyson rocked him hard many times. Mike's hands were like machine guns, and it was plain to see that they cloned both boxers from the height of their prime. What brought back this memory, though, were the protesters out front. There weren't many of them, and the masses wrote them off as conspiracy theorists who needed to lay down the pipe and get more fresh air, but something they said now chilled me to the core. One of the men caught me as I was passing by and gave me a handout that said, Save the Clones, with a bit of information underneath, including their website. He told me about the inhumane conditions in which the clones were made to train. At the time, they sounded laughably false, and it was all I could do to not be rude to the man and ask him to leave me alone so I could get back to my friends. He said that they made clones of their opponents for them to train, that they even made clones of only their top half so that they could train in place against their foe. The most gruesome of all were the mannequins that were topped with the heads of clones who had not fought hard enough, and the mounds of bodies that lay as a constant reminder of what waited in store for the clones still alive and training if they did not push with all their might to become the best they were capable of. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life. Facts are, there are just some things you can't go to your friends and family with. Like holidays, for instance. We just had one at the beginning of the month. 
And I know personally, family gatherings can be stressful. I'd never tell them that, though, so as not to hurt their feelings. It feels good to be open and honest, two of the many ingredients needed for better mental health. And BetterHelp provides you with the distance and semi-anonymity to do just that. BetterHelp is real, professional counseling tailored to your needs that you can do online. It's more affordable than traditional therapy, and for those who need it, financial aid is available, meaning that the people who need it most can have better access to help that's, well, better. Thanks to BetterHelp, it's never been easier to care for your mental health. All you have to do is take the first step. Most anyone can benefit from counseling, both professionals and do-it-yourselfers. Whether it's depression, anxiety, internal struggles, or any other problem standing in your way, BetterHelp is the tried and true tool to get you up to task again. This is no gimmick, folks. It's professional therapy online. Quick, discreet, convenient, and at a price that's attainable. Here's how it works. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with your own licensed therapist who specializes in your specific needs. You can reach out anytime and receive timely, thoughtful responses. Also, you can schedule weekly phone or video sessions at your convenience. In short, you'll never be winging it again. Your personal counselor will always be close at hand. No office visits necessary. It's professional help right in your pocket. Not a fan of being on screen? That's okay. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. And remember, you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash horrorhill. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horrorhill. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I thought it would be impossible for atrocities like that not to make their way into public knowledge. Surely there was some decency left in humanity that this type of thing could not exist in the world. Sure, in ancient times there were cruel acts of torture where men were pulled apart and had their flesh ripped off with red-hot tongs. This was 2069 though, and that type of gore would not go unnoticed. Those were my thoughts at the time. However, after what I had seen, I feared I was all too wrong. The gentleman appeared from the back with my stack of pancakes topped with butter and syrup. I pushed my coffee cup and the carafe out of the way, already well into my second cup. I told him everything looked delicious and thanked him before asking if I could go ahead and pay now, as I had an appointment to make. He obliged by taking his noticeably older scanner than those in the big city and scanning the chip in the back of my hand. I tore into the pancakes like I hadn't eaten in days. Honestly, it almost felt like the truth. After I finished eating and had my fill of coffee, I stepped out of the chair and made my way to the exit. The facility tour was just a little walk down the street, and I would be making it there in plenty of time to look around before the tour started. There was a sign on the front of the building, Hans Driesch Cloning and Training Facility. The building was easy to spot. It was a large structure made up of mostly glass and steel, as far as I could tell. It gave the visual appearance of trying to seem transparent and letting the public know there was nothing to hide, a notion that I knew to be entirely false, although I understood well why they would put up such a facade. The people would be rioting in the streets if they knew even half of the truth. I walked into the lavishly decorated lobby and was greeted right away by the receptionist. She let me know that I could purchase my ticket to the tour with her and that there was fresh coffee and hot water for tea in the sitting corner. I walked over to her desk, scanned my hand to ensure my access to the next tour, and thanked her 
before walking around to take in the scene. A family of three was waiting in the sitting area, presumably going on the same tour I had just arranged to take. A father, mother, and son who must have been around ten years old. I tapped both sides of my glasses to initiate recording mode. I might want this tour to be analyzed in further detail later. It's always better to have more information in cases like this. On the walls were pictures of past presidents at the facility and pictures of clones that appear to be getting much better treatment than those I saw just yesterday. I did my best to hide all emotions so as not to draw any unwanted attention to myself. Inside, though, was an overwhelming feeling of disgust. I decided to take a seat in a chair far enough away from the family to give them their space and took my phone out to waste some time before the tour started. I ran across a local story about a man who had become lost at the Robert H. Treman State Park yesterday and was screaming for help, but they assured the readers that he was found by park rangers and assisted. The story supposedly took place right around the same time the clone got loose and was murdered by the facility's staff. They were very thorough. That much was clear. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would so kindly join me by the entrance to the facility, I would be happy to guide you along the tour. My name is Ian, and I will be overjoyed to lead you through what many have described as a life-changing and eye-opening journey through the incredible world of the cloning program. The tour guide was overly cheery, and I couldn't help but wonder if he understood the truth behind what was going on here, or if, like most of the world, he was just blindly being led along to think that there was nothing amiss. We all made our way over to the man who was dressed formally, which made me worry about my homely appearance. I had not changed clothes since before Woodstock, but had at least been able to wash up the night before at my cabin. The family was dressed quite casually as well, so I put it out of my mind and prepared myself for what lay ahead. A large metal sliding door was sealed behind him, and after thanking us for our interest in the facility, he scanned his forehead at the door and stood back as the light on the screen flashed green and the door came sliding open to allow our entrance. I never understood why some people chose to have their chips implanted in their foreheads rather than their hands. To each their own, I guess. I've seen the statistics before, and the overwhelming majority of people choose their hand because of the convenience factor. As we made our way in, the sliding door closed behind us, and we followed our guide down the hall and around the corner. To your left, you will see the state-of-the-art training facilities where our clones can achieve the glory they're destined for. They must push themselves very hard to obtain the level of capability that you have no doubt seen at some point, but we ensure they are well taken care of on that journey. The tour guide spoke while gesturing toward a wall made of a thick plate of glass. On the other side were a few clones being tended to by personal trainers in a facility surrounded by the best exercise equipment as far as the eye could see. It made me wonder how some of the clones ended up in this cushy job where they could put on a show for the public about how well the clones were treated. It had to be the ones who were compliant from the very beginning, and possibly even sold out their counterparts. We continued down the hallway after taking considerable time to gawk at the gym. I glanced over at the other family. We were still admiring the world-class exercise room. The young boy was wide-eyed and full of wonder. If only he knew the truth of what was happening to the clones. I shudder to think of how a child would react to what I had seen. The next stop was the spa. Clones were relaxing and getting massages next to those with hot stones across their backs. A large sauna was in the corner of the room with a see-through wall. Two clones were inside sweating it out, presumably after an early workout in the previous area. In the other corner of the room, there were steaming hot tubs that appeared to be made of natural stone and appeared to be hot springs rather than manufactured structures. A few clones were at the back of the room, getting their feet rubbed with a hot towel over their face. It truly was a little slice of heaven, but its hypocrisy infuriated me. It was so fake that nobody who came through even had a clue. 
As you can see, the clones are in the lap of luxury and are treated with only the finest in the Hans Driesch facility. If you follow along this way, we will make it past the Olympic-sized swimming pool and over to the cryogenic and sensory deprivation areas," the tour guide said smugly with a voice that I couldn't help but resent. I knew it was possible that he could be entirely in the dark about it all, but I hated this whole situation, and to me, he was a part of it. We moved on through the rest of the incredible areas intended for the treatment and training of the clones, but it was what we saw after that which truly caught my attention. Now for the final and most miraculous section of our tour. Here is the scientist's facility where they do their cloning and much of their work behind those closed vault doors for privacy. Nobody likes having someone look over their shoulder while they work on something special. There is something quite more interesting for you to feast your eyes on right here on the other side of the glass. The cloth that those two scientists are working on is the fabled Shroud of Turin. It was once thought to be a complete myth and only created by swindlers for the monetary gain of showcasing it to the faithful. This one was unearthed only this year, and we believe that we might be on the brink of making an exact clone of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Some might call it the second coming, as it were. Ian, the tour guide, finished his piece and sat back to let us stare in wonder and amazement at what was truly a world-changing event. This was like an out-of-body experience to witness. My blood ran cold as soon as he spoke of it as the second coming. I've never been much of a religious man, but I knew enough to know what comes with the second coming of Christ. Suddenly, it was no longer about me and my little situation of hoping not to get caught for seeing what I saw. Now, it was about an epic problem on a global scale. Listen to me. I sound like one of those religious nuts I always made fun of, preaching their doomsday messages and urging us not to fall into temptation. Being this close to what was about to happen in the flesh gave me a sort of gut reaction that went straight past any type of thinking process that I might muster. This was going to be bad. I could feel it. My logical brain might believe this would be just like any of the other clones they made, but my pure animal instinct told me it was much worse. Something that had been written of for thousands of years before they even knew exactly how it might happen. This would be Armageddon. After we gawked at the scientist and the shroud for a while longer, we were led to the exit by Ian and thanked warmly for touring their facility. He made sure to let us all know individually that he appreciated our coming and invited us back for a tour any time that we liked. I had to get home. This was all way too much. I needed to make my way back and give myself some time to process all of this information. Not that there would ever be enough time to fully understand everything that was happening. I pulled out my phone and summoned the nearest air taxi to take me back to my car at the library. My head was reeling, and it was going to be nice to make it back to my vehicle finally. The ride felt much shorter this time, as my mind was going a thousand miles per minute. When we arrived at the library, I thanked the driver and tipped him by scanning my right hand and typing the number that I felt was fair on the touchscreen he held. My car was still there, and how sweet it felt to open that door and hop right in. Maybe I would just go home and enjoy the rest of my vacation, act like all of this never happened. I doubted I would be able to, but it was a nice thought. I told the car to take me home and agreed to the playlist that it chose for me to listen to on the way. I arrived at my home after quite a long drive from Bethel. I lived in a high-rise condo in downtown Manhattan. I scanned my hand at the door to gain entrance and walked briskly through the lobby into the elevator pod. I stepped in and scanned my hand as I sat in the seat to secure my harness and prepare for the ride. It flashed my information and residence before me to ensure that was my destination. I agreed by tapping yes on the screen and was ready to take my ride home. The pod shot up along the rail to the 92nd floor. 
Once there, it adjusted to the horizontal rail and shot me to the 64th room. It opened and allowed me to step out of the pod before returning to its original location. I scanned my hand at the door to enter my condo, stepping into my house for the first time in days. As stressful and eventful as this week had been, it felt like much longer than just one week. I walked through the living room, into my bedroom, and collapsed onto the bed. I turned on the television that took up the wall opposite the windows for a little background noise. I looked towards the blinds and called out for them to open so I could look out at the beautiful view. After laying there for a while and reflecting upon everything that had gone down, I decided. There was nothing that I was going to be able to do to help this situation. It was just too far out of my control. I decided to continue with my life, which had been treating me very well before I stumbled upon all this madness. I took great joy and comfort in this idea and let my body relax, letting all the tension release from my shoulders and sinking back into my pillow. My relaxation abruptly ended when I heard a breaking broadcast cut onto the screen beside me. After the alert that assured that breaking news was about to appear, the reporter came on screen and began to speak. Reports tell us that today marks a new era in human history. Today, scientists at the Hans Driesch cloning facility have made a breakthrough that many thought would never be possible. They attained a strand of DNA from the newly unearthed Shroud of Turin and were able to make a full and exact clone of Jesus Christ. We will shortly be cutting to footage of the clone that many call the second coming of the Messiah. This is an exciting and riveting time to be alive. We are so glad to be the first to share this breaking update with the public. Thank you for your viewership and please enjoy the footage and pictures from this groundbreaking day. I told my TV to change to another news station so I could see another take on this new event. They had a pastor on the screen who was being interviewed on the topic. He started by reciting a piece of scripture that they, in turn, put up along the bottom of the screen. The camera cut to the footage of the cloned Jesus, who looked a bit out of sorts as he adjusted to his existence. Revelations 13.16 And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. My jaw dropped as I heard the man speak these words. We had all received the mark of the beast without even the slightest understanding of what we had done. My dreams of a normal and happy life that I once knew were over. Now was the time for action. Whether I liked the idea or not, it seemed that a battle that would bring about the end of the world was just around the corner. I was experiencing a bit of sensory overload after the events of the past few days. I needed to take a shower and prepare myself for those events that were still to come. One thing had to be done first, and I knew it, no matter how terrible it would be. I went to my kitchen and got out a steak knife. I paced back and forth with it for a moment and then set it down to go into my freezer. There was a bottle of gin in there that I kept for special occasions. This wasn't the usual type of occasion that I would be going to it for, but then again, nothing had been usual about this week. I twisted off the lid, took a huge swig of the liquor, and then took one more for good measure. My face contorted into a disgusted pucker that my friends and I used to refer to as the gin face, and I twisted the lid back onto the bottle. After the lid was tightly closed, I placed the icy bottle atop my right hand and pressed down, holding it there for an extended period to numb the skin as much as I could. The chip had to come out. Of that much, I was certain. If this all turned out to be a paranoid delusion brought on by the festivities of the Woodstock Centennial, then I could always have it reinserted later. I grabbed a hand towel and put it in my mouth, biting down as I located the spot where my chip had been implanted. I pushed the tip in first to break the skin and shimmied it back over the area where my chip was planted. 
I grimaced at the pain, but pushed through it, and looked through the open portion of the wound to ensure that I could see the chip. I had placed the cut perfectly, and could make out the small, square-shaped chip beneath it. I pushed the tip of the knife into the cut and slid it over to the side of the chip. This caused me to grunt into the towel and bite down harder. I pushed the chip upwards from the side and reached down with my finger, grabbing it with the side of the knife and my fingertip like some makeshift forceps. I yanked it out of the incision and dropped it onto the countertop along with the knife. Immediately, I grabbed the towel from my mouth and applied pressure to the bleeding wound on my right hand. The ultra-religious folks had caused an uproar about the chips, and it didn't help that they were released in June of 2066 to the general public. Or, in other words, 6 of 66. Looking back, they may have had a point, but most people were taken in by how much easier the chips made everything. There was no need to carry around a wallet or keys anymore, and they stored all the data you would ever need for identification. Passport, driver's license, memberships, etc. After people began to see how easy it was just to have a chip, they caught on like wildfire, and only a very few extremist religious folks kept away from them. They were ostracized from society and seen as cultists who needed to adapt to the times. I made my way to the bathroom and bandaged up my hand, using some gauze and tape. I was starting to form a plan in my mind, but I didn't know if it made any sense or if there was any way it was going to work. Before any of that was going to happen, I needed to take a quick shower and get myself properly prepared to take on Doomsday. You couldn't take on the beast from the sea without brushing your pearly whites, right? This was all so insane. I was half expecting to wake up in a loony bin somewhere, quietly muttering to myself about cloned Jesus Christ and stacks of bodies by an incinerator hidden in a state park somewhere. It would be more believable than what was happening in the present moment. I got out of the steaming hot shower and proceeded with a towel around my waist to get dressed and head back out into this huge mess. As I grabbed my last essentials and made my way to the door, I heard a strange humming noise coming from the kitchen. I walked over out of curiosity and saw the chip on the counter. It was undoubtedly the source of the noise that I was hearing, and it was doing something very strange. There were waves of red pulsing across the top of it, which almost had a bit of a kaleidoscope effect. I had never heard of the chips behaving this way but I guess there was no telling what it did underneath your skin. Still, something about it seemed very strange to me. I had to get some more answers and see what I could do to improve this situation. I was going to have a much harder time getting around now, but I made sure to grab my wallet that I still had stashed away, along with a few keys for the few things that would still allow me to lock or unlock them manually. My car would still allow me to use it with face scanning technology and passcode, but many things in today's society would not work without the chip. Luckily, my wallet still had my pass key for the pod to leave the high rise. There were ways to walk to the ground floor, but I was not exactly hoping to have to climb down 92 floors. I sat in the pod and shot over to the rail that led down to the lobby. After that, my pod made its descent to the ground floor. When I got out to the street, I couldn't help but feel like something was off. There were cars parked in the middle of the road. There was no person visible for miles either way. I summoned my car and hopped in, unsure where I would be heading. I engaged the vehicle in manual mode instead of its usual autopilot, as I was not entirely sure where this trek might lead me to. I would have to dodge around the cars that were strewn about in areas that would cause you to believe their drivers were running from a natural disaster or something of the sort. I saw a crowd of people in a trance-like state walking around the corner of the block. I slowed down and crept up to the edge of the block to see what they were heading towards. A sea of people made their way towards Central Park, which was just a bit further down the street. I would stick out like a sore thumb if I continued to drive at this point. I knew that I had to ditch the car for now if I was going to continue this way. 
I saw a nearby parking lot and pulled over before pulling into an open spot and locking the car up on my way out. Making my way over to the stream of people, I did my best to mimic their expressionless faces and walking motions. This must be what was happening to the chip after I pulled it out. Some sort of mind control or whatever it was that was controlling all these people. Over a loudspeaker, I heard a man's voice as I drew near to the park, where there were people shoulder to shoulder, all with the same dazed look on their faces. Too many of you, my voice will be falling on deaf ears. Some of you have chosen to follow the cause voluntarily and will hear my words and follow them with fervor. It is to you individuals that I speak today, a day that will be remembered as the most important day in all human history. Today we become the master of our own destinies. We take on the army of the one who created us. Today. The student becomes the master, and the fiend finds Dr. Frankenstein and makes him pay for his misdeeds. We will slay the beasts with many heads of earth and water. The angel army will see that it is no match for the creation that has come to own the world, and we will continue our eternal reign of power and might. Let the Leviathan come to our warships. Let the behemoth attack our troops on land and the four horsemen will see that the only apocalypse that shall befall this world is the one of the false god's chosen army. Those who follow the one who has forsaken and left us for all this time to fend for ourselves, who has treated us like Job and expected our blind obedience to him without so much as a helping hand for our race that has faced countless perils through the years of our existence. It has always been us who helped each other throughout all this time. When disaster would strike, we would reach down and lift our fellow man and carry them through the hardships. When wars were fought, we would join forces against the intentions of evil and move on past the rule of tyranny. So too will we rise together and fight against the hand of tyranny, against the angels of heaven who have stood for all this time looking down upon us in judgment, never coming to raise a sword against evil never coming to feed those in need. Yet now they come to take what we have built for ourselves and claim it as their own? I shall not stand for this. We as humanity shall not stand for this as a whole. We have taken measures to ensure that this is the case. It is not enough to have those who are willing to fight to take on this task. We must have every living human being ready to attack in unison. The children alone will be kept in the safest of care. This alone would not be enough, however. We in the natural human race are the strongest force on this earth by far. It was always written that we would not be able to take on such a task ourselves. That is why we started the cloning program. We have perfected the army that will be able to defend our soil from those who plan to invade it and usurp us from our throne on this planet. We have taken the strongest of us and made them even stronger through the most intense and incredible training the world has ever known. Some find it unethical, and many who are aware of it believe that achieving the goal is not worth the sacrifice. They are short-sighted and cannot see the odds that we are up against in this fight. The man's speech was blasting out throughout the park, and it seemed that it was carrying out much further. I could not believe what I was hearing. This was too much to wrap my head around. I tried to focus on maintaining a face with no expression, to blend in perfectly with those around me who obviously did not think to pull the chip out themselves. The man continued to speak. We need every resource available. Every nuclear weapon, every tank, every ship of war, every fighter jet. We will attack people of every nation, every walk of life, no matter the cost. Those who refuse to join and have refused the chip will also fall into our hands. The time for coddling is over. The time for all-out war and complete destruction is now. Only in this way will we have any chance of seeing the phoenix of humanity rise from the ashes of Armageddon and continue to rule this world that is ours. The clones are essentially necessary to our plan and will be the strongest fighters among us. 
While some of us have trained with all our might, the clones have trained for their whole lives. While some of us have pushed ourselves to the brink in hopes of becoming the best that we possibly could, the clones knew that if they did not push even harder, their death was waiting for them just around the corner. Brothers and sisters, the time is now. We have created in them soldiers who are at the peak of the human physical condition, specimens who will fight alongside us and decimate the army of the heavenly invaders. Judgment Day is upon us and the judgment will be ours for the making. God will rue the day he tested his creation's strength." There was a thunderous and raucous applause that came after this statement. Everyone within my general area remained still and calm without a look of understanding among them. Many were pumping their fists in the air and whooping excitedly toward the front. They must have been members of different government or military programs who were not chipped and had signed up for this undertaking earnestly. I wasn't sure what my plan was, but I was certain that I had to get away from here. I was luckily far away from the eyesight of anybody who might catch a glimpse of my flight. I ducked down, staying behind the backs of the people under mind control and made my way down a nearby alley. I knew a place nearby where there were many doomsday preacher types. They would always have people out front telling passers-by to repent and prepare for the day of judgment. They were the types to not get chips and made everyone who did have them feel terrible about themselves whenever possible. In hindsight, they may have had a point in doing so. I made it over to the street that the church was on and carefully poked my head around the side of the alley. The building was engulfed in flames, and the smoke billowed up from the steeple. Not only was this a dead end, but also a stark reminder of what might lay in store for me if I took the wrong turn moving forward. I pulled my head back into the alley and pressed my back against the brick wall behind me, placing my hands on my head. Hey, up here! A voice called out from above, shocking me out of my distressed position. I looked up and saw an older man with salt and pepper hair. There isn't much time. Take the fire escape and hurry. They're swarming the area right now. I wasn't sure who exactly he meant, but I immediately took heed to his warning and climbed up the fire escape. He was in the third floor window and helped me climb through when I made my way to the top. Close the drapes behind you. I'm sure you have plenty of questions. You're the first I've seen without a chip which is not in the Order or from the church who suffered the unfortunate tragedy you just witnessed." The man walked past a bookshelf and into a sitting room. I followed behind him and a wall hanging caught my eye. It was a sepia-colored scroll inside of a frame with an excerpt from the scripture in Ezekiel 9-6 which read, "'Slay utterly old and young both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. It's a relic, passed down in the Order. We've always had an affinity for the apocalyptic. This piece dates back to the 1600s when the King James Bible was first published. He sat down in a large backed burgundy chair with a wooden frame next to a settee with another chair like his beside it. He motioned for me to have a seat so we could continue the conversation, which thus far was dominated by his explaining and my hopelessly trying to understand. I sat and listened intently to every word the man had to say. We focus mainly on the part of the scripture that speaks of not coming near those with the mark, though the beginning of it might make more sense to you now if you could catch any of the dreaded speech that was just given and blasted all around the city. You see, we are the Order of the Son of Man, and we have a nearly divine mission to stop the corrupted government and ensure that the Lord and the Heavenly Army can capture the world and return us all to the paradise we've been promised. You don't have to be a practicing Christian to see that the words of the Holy Bible have come alive all around us. It then would be only fitting to follow the principles of that text and ensure that we are on the side that is undoubtedly going to come out victorious and conquer the war for the Earth. It only takes a basic understanding of probability to dissect that we are but mortal beings, attempting with all our collective might to take on the divine. 
I don't like our chances in the situation, nor do we in the Order. We're a collection of souls who came together to seek understanding of what might come with the end of the world. We did not accept the microchip and had been training throughout the ages to be ready to take on the forces of man we knew would so foolishly attempt to take on its creator out of pure vanity. We searched through all apocalyptic texts and planned accordingly in a coordinated effort that stretched the whole world around. The cloning program and the atrocities therein only reinforced our belief that the leaders who were corrupting humanity must be stopped by any means. They have tortured the poor soldiers whom they've kept in hiding all this time. They've killed countless of those who have failed to adhere to their guidelines. Perhaps the most intrinsically deceitful of all, though, they have infiltrated society to insert their clones in the places of those of us that they chose arbitrarily to see scientifically how they might be able to control the population with clones. They started with the beggars and then the working class choosing capriciously all along to not maintain a pattern if anything were to go awry. After this, they made their way to a more structured population of replaced people once they could control what they were doing more completely, reaching up to world leaders who would not adhere to the tenets of the preparations for Armageddon. Imminent is the time they will call upon all of the clones to join the fight, likely within this very hour meaning our time to move into battle position is drawing quite near. I believe that he could tell how his words affected me, and he stopped for a moment to offer me a glass of water. I told him that I would greatly appreciate one and thanked him for the gesture. This was so much to think over, and I knew the time was of the essence. One thing was becoming increasingly clear to me. I was going to have to choose the side that I wanted to join. There was so much to consider. The man who spoke in Central Park made some very compelling points. It almost felt like our world as we knew it was being invaded and forcibly taken from us. That was not a good feeling, and did not exactly push you to want to join forces with those who are taking the Earth by storm. On the other hand, I had seen the atrocities the government committed with the cloning program. There was absolutely no way that I could believe that the institution behind what I had seen would be the side on the right. Maybe they were a bit misguided in their judgment as to why they had chosen to take their actions. Although not in the right by any means, especially after hearing everything that I had heard today about cloning that I was previously unaware of when I laid my eyes on those piles of bodies. Yes, I think it was clear enough to me what I would have to do. My choice was made, and there wasn't a second to lose. The man returned to the room and handed me my water, which I quickly gulped before setting it down on the ornate coffee table. I looked up and spoke for the first time since I made my arrival. My name is Joachim Fredriksen, and I have decided that I am ready to join your cause. If I must join this order that you speak of, I am willing to do so. There's no cause so great that it could justify the means they've been taking at the expense of people who are unwilling to cooperate with them and unwittingly what they have been doing in the shadows. The man responded and looked at me approvingly as he now sat back in his place across from me. That is very good, Joachim. You are undoubtedly a bright man to do so. We're fighting for what is right here in the Order, and we will be more than happy to have you among our ranks. I apologize for skipping the pleasantries, as you can surely realize it's essential that I promptly provide you with as much information as possible. My name is John Solomon. I'll communicate with the Order that we have a new member to be tried and raised in degree, albeit in a rather expedited form compared to the usual. I gladly welcome you as my brother and hope that you take solace in your decision. John rose to his feet and reached out with his hand. I stood as well and gripped his hand in a firm handshake that conveyed my genuine dedication to the cause that was upon us. Make yourself comfortable as I get in contact with the others. We shall depart as soon as we can work out a secure common meeting ground. Much of the city has been overtaken and nearly all of it is within surveillance. 
We must tread lightly, brother. The world depends upon the order to aid the Angel Army. Only then will we be able to see salvation delivered to those of us who used our best judgment and fought with all of our might. He nodded to me and stepped into the other room to make his calls. I felt a warm sense of belonging as we finished our talk, and I drifted off a bit while looking back towards the window I climbed up into just a short while ago. I could not rest with my thoughts for long, though, as his conversation was short and to the point in the other room. He walked briskly into the sitting area and spoke in a hushed and hurried manner. Joachim, we must make our way to the basement level this instant. The lackeys of the mind-controlled masses have surrounded the building. They'll be able to locate us shortly as they scan the building with drones to find anyone who's not yet assimilated with their ranks. He waved for me to follow, and we made our way out of the apartment's front door we had been speaking in. We headed down the hallway, and I could see the pods at the end of the hall that would have been able to transport us to the basement level if it wasn't for the fact that neither of us had chips that would allow us to do so. Suddenly, there came a beeping from behind us. There was a drone hovering at the opposite end of the hallway. It spotted us and was pointing a red beam in our direction. We took off in a full sprint to make it to the side with the pods, engulfed in complete and utter dread. We made it to the end of the hallway and saw that the pod systems were completely shut down, adding to their uselessness for our current situation. There was, however, a stairwell directly beside it, and I stepped around the corner towards it right as I heard a shot ring out. The security drone had connected with a plasma round directly to the back of John Solomon and dropped him right near my feet. He coughed out one last warning with urgency in his faltering voice. They're waiting for you. Get to the basement level as fast as you can. There's a carving on the wall. S-O-M. Press against it and speak your name, and you'll be let into the passage that leads to the temple. They haven't found it yet, and the brothers will defend you. Go! He coughed up blood and lay grasping his wound that would surely be fatal. I took heed to his words and dashed through the doors and down the stairs as quickly as my feet would let me go. Before I knew it, I had made it to the basement and was scanning the area for the marking on the wall. I found it across the room, hidden inconspicuously between shelves of cleaning supplies and other janitorial needs. I pressed my palm against the words and spoke my name in a panicked and hectic tone. I repeated it until the letters lit up and the wall moved back from its position and slid to the side. I rushed into the doorway and the door was closed swiftly behind me as I beheld the beauty of the Order's inner sanctum. The walls were covered in a lavish pattern of wallpaper that was the same color of burgundy as the chairs from the apartment where John Solomon had accepted me as a member. There were wooden pillars of mahogany at each interval of the wall, which was decorated with a gothic style and depicted many scenes that I did not have the time to admire. Most importantly, there stood my brothers, all dressed in large robes, who were eager to greet me and carry on with the plans we had to achieve. Brother, please join us in the Sanctum Sanctorum, where we will expedite the process of making you a full brother so that we can do what must be done to save what humanity this planet has left. We have no time to make introductions right now, but I assure you that you are among nothing but true and tried brethren who will die for and alongside you if needed in this fight. I am saddened to see that you arrived alone and believe it can mean nothing other than our brother John Solomon has already proven this to you so quickly upon your joining. I grimaced at his noting of this and gave him an acknowledging nod, but did not speak so as not to disrupt his speech so that we could continue to move through the process which awaited speedily. The man continued his speech. He was a strong and dedicated man. His passing will be the head on our spear as we pierce through the breastplate of our enemies. Joachim Fredrickson, we welcome you to the Order of the Son of Man with fervor and zeal. Take your place in front of your brethren and kneel upon the altar of the sun. I listened to his command, moved through the path they made for me between them and knelt down on the burgundy padding that sat upon the altar. 
A large mirror in front of it surely had some esoteric meaning in the ceremony. In it, I saw my brothers, the beautiful Gothic architecture, and myself on my knees in front of it all. Joachim Fredriksen, you have come of your own free will and accord to join with the Order of the Son of Man. We have come together in this ceremony to see that it is so, to bind you to the Brotherhood in the same way that we have bound all worthy brothers who have sought membership before you." The man paused in his speech, although I felt that he was not finished with his part. I began to feel incredibly strange. I initially worried that John had slipped something into my water, but that couldn't be. He was true to his word all the way to his death. I turned my focus to myself in the mirror and saw an expression on my face that terrified me completely. I had seen an expression just like it just a few days ago, and it had been the first thing that started me on this wretched journey. I had seen the same dazed and confused face on the clone of Jimi Hendrix when he began to try to speak the truth at the Woodstock concert. This couldn't be. I was still conscious, but I couldn't move a limb or anything else on my body. The man who had been giving my ceremony, as well as all the brothers, had taken instant notice of the state in which I was in. They seemed to recognize it as I had and he spat out his next words in complete disgust and pity. Those bastards! I am so sorry, Joachim. This is not your fault in the slightest. They are calling the clone armies to join in the battle. It appears that you have been unwittingly in the place of that one whose name you claim. I do this with great sadness but we cannot allow you to leave this place to fight against your own will and against what you have claimed to be your purpose. My brother, I hope we will join you and Brother John Solomon in paradise when this is all over." The man placed a robe over my dazed shoulders, raising my hood as a sign of becoming a full brother. He then pulled a ceremonial dagger out from under his robe. He came up to me and pressed it firmly to my throat. He looked me in the eye as I felt a single tear force through my body's strange possession, and he spoke the last words I would ever hear. Consumatum est. You've been listening to 2069 by Chris Kester. C.D. Kester is an author of fiction who does most of his work in the horror genre. He lives in Kingwood, Texas with his wife and two children. He has a self-published novella titled The Bunker, a short story published in Dreadful Nostalgia, Tavistock Galleria 2, and a drabble in the Route 13 anthology. Kester is currently working on his first full-length novel about a supernatural entity that is tormenting a town in Texas. You can follow him on his blog at cdkester.wordpress.com and on Twitter, username at cd underscore kester. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I do take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure that you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. 
Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.